first things first. I'm a... Welcome back to Byro Sports Talk. I'm your host, Byro, and let's just go ahead and dive right on it. There's, I don't have quick hits today, but let's go ahead and talk about some MLB news. So, since I'm from Ohio, one of the biggest news in uh, the MLB currently is the Indians get Jay Bruce from the Mets because Michael Brantley is on the disabled list. No figure. Anyways, let's get into the standings since that's what mostly I talk about with MLB right now. In the AL East, Boston's up four on the Yankees. AL Central, the Indians are up four on the Royals. Uh, in the West, the Astros are up 13. Their number's slightly dwindling, but, I mean, they've been coasting so far. For the AL Wild Cards, the Yankees are ahead of the Mariners two and a half games for the first wild card spot, and the Mariners are up one game over the Royals and the Rays for the final wild card spot. In the National League, we got, in the NL East, the Nationals up 14 games. In the NL Central, we got the Cubs up a game and a half on the Cards and the Brewers. The NL West, the Dodgers are up 15 and a half games. Right now, the biggest, well, not the biggest surprise, but the team with the best record in the MLB. Uh, for the Wild Cards, the Rockies are up a half game right now over the Diamondbacks. For the number one wild card spot and then the number two wild card spot, the Diamondbacks are up six and a half games on the Cards and Brewers. So that's all I have right now for MLB. Let's go ahead and hit the NBA before I hit the NFL. So the NBA, uh, Kyrie drama continues. Uh, the Timberwolves asked Wiggins to commit to the franchise, which is just exactly what it needs to be. But on the Kyrie drama, uh, part of it is the Cavaliers are trying to get what they want. Uh, the issue with that is you don't always get what you deserve. So some teams are thinking, oh, this is even trade, especially after Paul George left with not as much as he could have. So what I'm saying is the Pacers only got Oladipo and Sabonis for Paul George, and that was it. Not a, not a big game, like a big steal in some people's minds. So the final thing I have for the NBA, sorry. The Knicks asked Melo today to expand his list of trade possibilities. So right now they had four deals that could have been done. With the Blazers, the Cavaliers, the Thunder, and Pelicans. Apparently, there's been off and on rumors about the Cavaliers. I think the real issue with the Cavaliers right now is that Melo wants to be there. Kyrie wants to be on the Knicks. The Cavs want a King's Ransom for Kyrie. They're not going to get it. So... That's all I got for the NBA. I know I'm hitting these out like quick hits. Let's talk about probably the biggest section for today's show, football. The NFL. So let's start with the NFL football with the Hall of Fame game. So the stars and starters didn't play. They rested them. Uh, some notables from the game. The Cowboys ended up winning... I will look at the score real quick. For some reason, it's not in my notes for today, guys. I'm sorry. But let's talk about some of the other notes I do have. So, some notables from the game. We have Blaine Gappert, who's, for the Cardinals, a backup. He was 11 of 14, 185 yards. Not too bad for a backup. And... Another person I wanted to mention was uh, Trevor Knight, the rookie, I believe, Texas A&M, even though he used to play for Oklahoma in the Big 12. Uh, and one of the most memorable memories I have of Trevor Knight was Katy Perry on live TV saying how hot he was. So no surprise there coming from a pop, pop icon. Anyways, he was only 5 of 14, 68 yards. And, again, that was a little 
worst showing. Uh, for the Cowboys, Kellen Moore was 12 of 17, 182 yards, one touchdown, one interception. Not too bad. We get to the running backs. Rod Smith had 54 yards rushing. Again, not too bad. You're not going to see the numbers like you normally do in these preseason games because they're trying to get everyone to have reps. So, looking at the Hall of Fame game one more time, it was a 20-18 to 18 game. Cowboys won, for those of you who wanted the score. Uh, the inductees this year was kicker Morton Anderson, who played for many teams, running back Terrell Davis for the Denver Broncos, safety Kenny Easley of the Seahawks, uh, owner Jerry Jones, of course, of the Cowboys, uh, defensive end Jason Taylor, famous for the Dolphins, the Danian Tumblinson, running back famous for being on the Chargers, and quarterback Kurt Warner, who's flirted many times with being in the Hall of Fame and finally got it this year. So that specifically made me happy. I'm glad to see these guys inducted. Morton Anderson was a surprise, but at the same time, he was in the league for years and years, and it's just perfect for what they needed him for. Uh, some other news. Devontae Freeman signed a five-year extension, $41.25 million in new money from this deal. He is finally getting paid like he wanted. And let's talk about something else that might be a shocker. Uh, as a Bears fan, this isn't a surprise to me. I figured he would end up on this team. Hold on. Sorry, everyone. I'm trying to find... Trying to keep track of things. Well, anyways, let's get back to it. Uh, so Tannehill is out indefinitely this season. The Dolphins haven't set any type of timetable. And what does that mean? Well, they needed another player. They went and got Adam Gase's guy, Jay Cutler. Signs a one-year, $10 million year with the Dolphins. So what is the importance of this? Jay Cutler was very successful with uh, Adam Gase before. Uh, some would say he had a very one of his better years under him. I'm stat-wise. I think it was productive, but not as productive as people make it out to be. So I'm looking at it. He was he had 21 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. He did have his best quarterback rating at 92.3, and he did have 3,659 passing yards. And this was without Brandon Marshall. So my only issues... I mean, he got the best of Cutler rating-wise. Stats, not necessarily, but at the same time, it was, if you look at how much he played that year, 11 interceptions is probably his best besides 2011, but he didn't play all of 2011, I believe. So that's what you're looking at. So Jay Cutler... I think he can help them continue to be playoff bound, but I don't think they make playoffs because of Jay Cutler's lack of getting his teams to the playoffs. They do have a good team around him. Uh, Jay Ajayi will be intriguing for him, and quite frankly, it's going to be interesting. So, another game happened last night. The Texans lose... 27-17 to 17 to the Panthers in the preseason. Now, I know the preseason doesn't mean much to some of you. It doesn't really mean much to me either. It's interesting to see some of these rookies, and that's about it for me. So let's go over some stats. Uh, Deshaun Watson went 15-25. He did not start the game. He had 179 yards passing, and he got a rushing touchdown. So one of those scores was because of him, and that's awesome. Uh, Deontay Foreman, the Texas running back that they got, he had nine carries for 79 yard rushing yards, which is spectacular for limited carries. Now you look at the other, well, let's also mention Tom Savage. He started the game for the Texans. He was 9 of 11 
with 69 passing yards, which I look at the two stats, I kind of want to go with Watson right now. So for the Carolina Panthers, the Panthers, sorry, uh, the big rusher that I wanted to mention was Christian McCaffrey. He had seven carries, so two less than Foreman. And you're looking at 33 rushing yards. That's not spectacular. That's kind of subpar, honestly. So we'll have to see how that develops for them. So the quarterbacks for the Panthers in this game, you got Joe Webb. Yes, that Joe Webb. He played for the Minnesota Vikings before becoming a backup to a backup in Carolina. He was 7-14, 128 yards passing, two touchdowns, one interception. Not too bad. Derek Anderson was 4-5 with 76 yards and one touchdown. Again, Great, great play. Uh, I do want to talk about, I'm still going to, well, there's one more thing with the NFL before I start talking about someone else's articles. Now, this is something new, but let me get a, go ahead and address this next topic. Uh, GM Kevin Colbert called out Le, Le'Veon Bell, Bell only hurting himself with the holdout. So the Steelers think, Bell is hurting himself and his touches with this holdout. Not surprising. So now let's talk about some articles. So the first article I want to talk about, both articles are from Downtown Rams. If you haven't checked out their pays, I'll go ahead and post a description for Downtown Rams. Uh, so the first one's by a Facebook friend of mine, Jake Ellen Brogan. So, his article, Rams Offense Prime to Shock Everyone This Season. And quite frankly, I feel like I'm sipping a little bit of the Kool-Aid from this article. So reading it, I, he references Adam Whitworth. And the reason why I want to bring up this article is the importance of an offensive line. So the Rams last year were not necessarily the best. Some will say, well, Jared Goff wasn't quite what they were hoping for. Sorry, I'm just looking up some more stats. So again, people might say Goff was the issue I'm looking, they were 4 and 12. Before that, they were 7 and 9, 6 and 10, 7 and 9, 7, 8 and 1. They just never got over that hump and even got 500, which Jeff Fisher was supposed to do. So let's look at this past season for them, the 4 and 12. So they were at San Francisco to start the year, they lost 28 to nothing. They beat Seattle 9-3. They beat Tampa Bay 37-32. They beat Arizona 17-13. Now comes the interesting part of this. You've got Buffalo, who destroyed them, 30-19. You had a Detroit in a close game, so right there could have been a win. The Giants in a close game, another possible win. Carolina, another close win, or loss, sorry. So right there is three losses that could have been wins. They did beat New York Jets 9-6, lost to Miami by a score. Uh, New Orleans destroyed them. Of course, New England destroyed them. Atlanta destroyed them. The Seahawks destroyed them. They barely lost to San Francisco, and then there's Arizona. So what, what do I mean by looking at these scores? So I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5... Six games. Six games that they could have won. 22 to 21, uh, 14 to 10, 13 to 10, 17 to 10, 31 to 28, those type of games. So with those six games, if they just swung the other way, we're talking about a 10-win team right now. Now... That's a big 
statement to make, especially with Jared Goff as the quarterback, a rookie quarterback, uh, Todd Gurley not doing as much as he can. And some people look at, say, an offensive line for that issue. They weren't protecting Goff. They weren't protecting. They weren't getting a push for Todd Gurley. So looking at the stats, I mean, golf didn't start till later in the year. He had what you would expect from a rookie. Some eh numbers. Case Keenum had eh numbers. But the real disappointment was Todd Gurley. He only had 885 rushing yards for six touchdowns. He just wasn't the guy he should have been. Now, yeah, I mean, the stats you don't normally see, I don't see it here. So you don't see the blocking stats. I know in Madden you can look it up and other, I know in that form you can. But talking of this team, this offseason they went out and got Adam Whitworth. So what downtown Rams have noticed is he's been able to block superior linemen, so they had joint practices right now with Los Angeles Chargers. And he's been able to keep Melvin Ingram in check. Uh, Goff's been able to do check downs really well. Uh, really has been able to get the push that he needs from his offensive linemen. So you're just looking at some talent just by adding the one man. Now, does one man make an offensive line? No. It takes five cohesive t members to have a very good offensive line. Now, I know I'm saying now a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> let's go ahead and let's look at some other examples of teams that, you know, we you need to respect the offensive line. So, like, Seattle, for example, they kept trading pieces away of their offensive line, like Max Unger and whatnot, to get other pieces like a Jimmy Graham. While Russ, Russell Wilson has struggled a little bit because there's no offensive line. Yes, his legs keep him, his ability up, but you can't have him doing that his whole life. Now, I look at this, I said there were six winnable games, if you cut it in half even, you have your typical seven and nine Jeff Fisher season. However, in the off season they did cut him loose. It was a very respectable firing, I would say, and he took it like how I would expect every head coach to say. And the reason why I say this is because I've shared his video before of what he did the moment he knew he was fired. He told his coordinators, I will be the best reference for you for your new job. I will help you find a new job. And if I get another one, I'll make sure I keep you in mind. You guys are all winners in my book. And you can't ask for better character than that. Now the second article I really, really wanted to talk about is from Downtown Rams, Adam Gregos. And the reason why I want to talk about this article I I want to point out people are very realistic nowadays. So in Adam Gregos article, as much as how he writes it makes me think they're doing better, especially you know four and twelve, that's not very good. Here it is. Sorry, I wanted to make sure I pulled it up again. So, he teases it, saying, are they a playoff team? Will they fall short of 8-8 eight and eight again? And let's just, I'm just going to go ahead, bring up what he talks about. So the first game, he puts down as a loss. That's against the Andrew Luck and the Colts. He says it's going to be a 28-24 game. Personally, I think it depends on the ruling of Andrew Luck. Right now, they say he's out. But at the same time, they're not ruling him out for the first game. So he's out for preseason, just not the first game. 
looking at this, I, I could easily say I think the Rams do pull it out. Looking at last year, they came out of the gate strong after <laughs> after the 28 to nothing blowout by San Francisco. But they came out of the great gate strong last year. I think with that, that's what you want. Uh, I think, I mean, it's realistic. It will be a close game. And I think it's realistic for the Rams to win. So right now, they're 0-1, 1-0 in my book. So next, he, they play the Redskins. He, he writes, Kirk Cousins is in late season form, padding stats for his next franchise tag. Uh, Gerald Everett and Jordan Reed each haul in two touchdowns, and everyone finally sees why McVay wanted Everett as his first pick. They just they say the Rams aren't able to stay stride for stride, and they fall short. They say the score is roughly going to be 30 to 21, and of course the Rams lose again. I think that's very realistic, and I think that's a very realistic score. The thing I will admit the most about this article is I think these scores are very, very realistic. Besides the realistic outcome that he's written, I think everything is very, very well done, well written. So right now, between my opinion and Adam Grego's opinion, we got one and one for me, oh and two for him. <laughs> He talks about walking in with a swagger only known by those knowing they are about to win a freebie game because they play the 49ers next. And boy, are they rebuilding. Now, they had struggles with the 49ers last year, and they say it gives them a little issue in that they went on a last-minute seamer as golf hits Everett on for a 40-yard touchdown to give them the win. They predict the score 17 to 10. Uh, looking at the late season game where they lost 22 to 21 last year, I also looking at a lot of their early games. This is a very realistic score. Puts them at two and one or one and two. And again, very realistic. Last year they were three and one before they crumbled apart. Right now, they're two and one in my books, and one and one and two in the in Gregos books. So this one confused me a little bit. You said the Rams face a cowboy. Oh, I see it was fixed. I did see it was fixed. The Rams face a Cowboys team face, coming off of a strong season. He predicts the Rams keeping the offense in check and the Rams offense prevailing. Rams win it twenty to seventeen. This is where I'll flip. Again, I think the Cowboys do win. I think they just, the talent's there. However, again, though, very realistic. These Rams can do a lot better this year if Jared Goff is the Jared Goff they wanted, essentially. So the kid that they drafted, number one overall. So with that, we're looking at uh, two and two for both. The Seahawks and the Rams games they mentioned are always could go either way. And for this early season one, you see the Ram. He predicts the Rams winning again, just like last year, twenty-three to twenty. I I have to agree with it. Looking at when you think back. The Rams seem to always have the Seahawks number at least once a year. So I'll go ahead and say this early game is that one. So they're three and two sitting right now. It doesn't that's a surprising thing to say for this team. So the next game they have, he says Blake Bortles. Dot 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 dot. Win for the Rams, putting them at four and two. I see that too. My issue is only I could see it being worse. However, the Jaguars are just they have what they need. I just don't think they get going especially this early in the year 
even though this is like game, what did I say, four and two, so it'd be game six. So I could see four and two Rams right now. They say the Cardinals are too hard for the Rams to handle for the next game. He predicts 21-14. It could be a little more lopsided, of course. But that puts him at 4-3 and three before the bye week, which respectable, especially in the NFL, especially when you're trying to play for a playoff team. It's a great realization. The next game's against the Giants. This is where the losses start piling up. And he has it as a 30-13 to 13 blowout with Eli Manning with all those weapons, I I can see it. So now you're at four and four. You're at that five hundred mark. He has the Rams pulling out a miracle against the Texans. Again, all these are realistic in my eyes. Every team in the NFL can beat any team in the NFL. Yes, there's the Jets. Yes, there's the Niners. Some will include the Bears and the Rams and. Uh, the Browns, but these teams are all capable of beating other teams and flipping the script this year. So I'm just going to roll with his rankings. So right there's five and four. Looks great. How? So this is where I think I would flip. I I put I would have probably flipped the last game, and that's why I said I would just roll with it. The Viking, he says the Sam Bradford-led Vikings would beat them. I think if they are beating the Texans or beating the Cowboys, I think they can beat the Vikings. But they're at the Vikings, so thus why he put the loss, I'm sure. So let's continue with the loss. So our records are still the same if I flip. And we're looking at 5-5. Five and five. They say the Rams beat Drew Brees-led. Saints, I think the score is a little low, but it's a realistic predi prediction of 27-20. to 20. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised for the Breeze to come out and do what he did last year, destroy them. But, again, this is a more experienced Rams team defensively and offensively, and I think there's a lot of positive coming from it. Carson Palmer, he just once again goes with a loss with the Cardinals, 24-17. And with that, I believe there's six and six. Yep, with that, six and six. Uh, after that, they talk about a... Rams versus Eagles, number one versus number two matchup this year. He says... <laughs> <laughs> so, how Adam writes this, golf versus Wentz, the game the media has been waiting for. Who picked right? Is Wentz the true franchise quarterback? Golf and Wentz play lights out, connecting on deep passes, slants, post routes, all game long to try and prove who is the best. Wentz ends up getting a sore arm quarter four and can only throw bubble screens. Goff takes advantage and completes a deep shot to Tavon Austin that puts them ahead with less than a minute left. Wentz ends up going three and out on offense and the Rams walk away winners. Again, I know some of my some of the people who may watch this will disagree, but I can see this happening. I can see the Rams pushing for this. So right there's your seventh win of the season. Seven and six. Now, the Rams cannot sweep the Seahawks. Again, Wilson makes a play and they lose to the Seahawks 23 17. I can see that. So, seven and seven. You see, he then goes on to the next game at the Titans. He's predicting this right. Everyone's afraid of the Titans this year because they look like they're going to just blow up on the scene. And he says Mariota and Henry will just destroy. <laughs> he, he goes even to saying Goff throws four interceptions. And the Titans win 30 to the Rams 10. Now, 
I'll go ahead and be the optimistic person here, but I don't see Goff throwing four interceptions, maybe two. But, and the reason I say that is, I don't think they're going to let Goff just gunsling it all game long. Even if they get behind a lot, it's better to stay in control with the run game than to just sling and sling and sling. So, sitting at that seven and eight, he goes ahead and say, Rams post back-to-back duds, the playoff hopes squash, they play uninspired, and they lose to the 49ers out at the season end, 14-10. Now, it's possible. I, I Again, I don't disagree with this record, but I could argue 8-8 eight eight is very realistic for this team, too. Now, here, I want to just quote his summary. In some Rams end up going 7-9, showing remarkable improvement in execution, talent development, and tenacity on all the units. Mistakes were made along the way, and that was to be expected. Goff shows steady improvement and a real reason to be excited about him going into third year. McVay proves his mettle as a legitimate NFL head coach, and Gurley returns to form. The focus for the next two years becomes building upon Goff's development and bringing in talent to protect him along the offensive line. The arrows pointing up in Los Angeles. Again, sounds amazing. Been reading a lot of these articles from Downtown Rams. Honestly, if I had to pick a non-last year playoff team like I do for Madden, okay, when I play Madden, I, I think the Rams are that team. And I've had the Rams before. I would get rid of Sam Bradford, of course. But now with Gurley, Goff, all this, I'm really, really excited. And I think they have every reason to think they can do well. Now, in the spirit of this, uh, I'm sorry I'm looking down. I'm looking up the Bears schedule. So I want to do my take on my team's wins, losses this year. And before I continue, for those of you who don't know, Schmoogle House Productions are doing a Nightwing show. Also, Attack Gaming is making a comeback. Our first episode will be posted... Let me double check real quick on a date. I will be posting it on the 18th of August. So stay tuned for that, you anti gaming fans. Now, there it is, my trusty pen. Now, for those curious what I was doing, I was digging through my bag. I technology coordinator for school and of course I carry around everything in a book bag so gotta find my pen so let's talk about the Bears this time so the Bears this year besides tonight going up against the Broncos should be good all right, season schedule. Oh, since I'm talking about the season schedule, I'll go ahead and mention this also. There will be a game December 10th. I will do a quick live update there because my lovely wife is taking me there for my birthday that was in July. So almost exactly... Half a year after, I will be watching the Bears play the Bengals. Now, let's start from the beginning for the predictions. So week one, what better way to be rewarded than playing the defending NFC North, or the, sorry, not the North, the NFC champions, Atlanta Falcons. 
Now, I think we can do well. I don't think we pull out a win on this. I think it will be at least two touchdowns. So I'll go ahead and mark that up as a loss. Now, Tampa Bay, a team that improves every year. As much as I want to say we could probably squeak that one out. Tampa Bay is just improving too much. They got more weapons this year. I think, once again, I'm sadly staring at another loss in the last column. Now, the Steelers, at home, all I can say is I stare at this, I stare at this, there's just no way that Mike Lennon get it, gets it done for us. We're sadly starting 0-3 this year. Looking at the Green Bay Packers, the next week in week four, it's in Green Bay. I think we don't get what we need done. We're looking at 0-4 to start the year. Now, Minnesota in Chicago. I think that's one we steal. And the reason for that is we have an extended week. We play on Thursday in week four. We play the Monday of week five. So we get the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then an extra day week to Plan. So that puts us at one and four. Uh, the Ravens the following week with the Joe Flacco issue currently. I think we go ahead and chuck up another win for us. Uh, the Panthers at home. Um, do I think we could win? Yes. Do I think we do? No. So I'll go ahead and mark up another loss. I. I want to be positive about my team, but I think this is a year where Lovey, not Lovey, John Fox needs to prove that he can lead us to the promised land, and I just don't think it's going to get done. Um, so Panthers, I said we lose. I'm looking at two and five. That's seven. Okay. Chicago at New Orleans. I'm going to give us another squeaker there. Three and five, not bad. Green Bay at Chicago. I'm going to give it to Green Bay. Lions at Chicago. I'll give us the squeak on that one. I'll give the Philadelphia Eagles in week 12 the win. Because it's at Philly. We beat. San Fran, I think we win against the Bengals because I'm there. <laughs> and I just, I think there needs to be more weapons for Cincinnati. Week 15 game against the Lions. I'll go ahead and give that to the Lions. I think we beat the Browns at home. And I think the Vikings beat us as they're at home. Now, in the end, I thought I was going to lean towards a lesser record. I have us at 7-9. and nine. Now, realistically, are we going to be 7-9? and nine? No, I think realistically we'll be 6-10. and 10. And that's because I think wanting a Vikings victory at home, probably going to stumble against the Lions at home. These games are not going to probably go in our favor. It just depends how well Mike Lennon decides to play. Now, Mike Lennon might come out and do really well with nobody. However, we'll have to see again. I mean, we are talking about a guy who hasn't been a starter for a while. And last time he was a starter, he did really, really well. Stat-wise, anyways. So, I know I say so, I know I say like, I'm human. 
some people are going to say, well, the whole reason why you record is to edit those out, and quite frankly, as much as I edit, I edit because I want stuff over here, or title down here. I think that's more beneficial. Some NCAA football stuff I want to talk about. You're looking at a recent article about LSU's strong stance this summer where teams just decided, hey, or sorry, let me rephrase this. LSU decided to go to all Louisiana camps this summer and be like, uh, we don't want anyone from out of state at your camps. You either put teams from in-state in your camps, put us at your camps, or we won't support you. We will pull scheduled games out of your recommended slot. Now, to some, that might be like, okay, what does that do? Well, if you're these little schools, they make $500,000 on playing LSU during the year. That's a lot. And some get paid a million dollars just to play LSU in a year. Now, another stat that's crazy to think about is L Louisiana, the state, has produced a lot of prospects. And they're roughly a top 10. I say top 10. I wanted to say top 5 because I believe that's what the article said. I'm going to double check that real quick. But let's continue. A top 10 in producing in producing the talent um, LSU football. Let's see if I can find it that way. Uh, do, 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 do. Sorry everyone, again, just trying to make sure I bring you the most accurate news. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of recruiting stuff. I'm not seeing the article right now. So, so what they were getting at is Again, I'm just trying to look for it. But, so the top 10 for recruits as a state, however, they're the 26th biggest state. So that just shows how little the state is. So with that, you got teams from Texas trying to recruit out of there, Florida, Bama, Ohio, uh, Michigan, the list can go on and on. You know the big schools that are going to come down there are mostly going to be southern schools, so it's going to be your Texas, your Floridas, your Bamas. Now I say Texas because Texas A&M tries to recruit there. Uh, Texas tried to have a camp. Texas Tech tried to look, I think. However, Michigan was the big one last this past summer with it where Jim Harbaugh got all, <laughs> trying to think of a nice way, annoyed by it. They were scheduled for a satellite camp. They decided to, or sorry, the school Tulane decided to reschedule the day, kick Michigan out, and schedule it with LSU. Now, some people are saying, well, they're a private school, they're okay. Uh, it was their decision. Some others are saying, well, LSU had some issues there. Uh, again, I think, personally, if they want to keep people out of their state, it's up to them. I know if teams want to go into the state, this is just traditional anyways. Teams are going to fight, and teams are going to argue, and that's just how it's going to be, and it doesn't matter what anyone thinks. <laughs> Um, 
also just wanted to mention the wild world of college sports. If you haven't checked out Netflix's Last Chance You, I definitely recommend it, especially season one. Um, partially through season two, I'm looking to finish it up shortly. It's just great to see how these kids who had everything try to turn it around. Uh, looking at Chad Kelly, he's now on the Broncos, who once again tonight playing the Bears. Uh, again, these are pre-recorded before they're posted, so you're going to see a lot of this, and it's just not going to make any sense. So I'm sorry for any today references. Um, again, check out Downtown Rams. I'm excited for what they're doing. Uh, they've been around for a while. I just personally started reading more and more of their stuff as the season's been going. And quite frankly, I'm excited for the Rams. They look like they're going in the right direction, just like how I'm excited my team might be going in the right direction. But my team might not have the success that they have. So, uh, again, I want to have another shout out here for Schmoogle House Productions. Also want another shout out for Atta Gaming. If you haven't heard, the revival's real. <laughs> uh, so, sitting at roughly 45 minutes of this episode, I know I kind of rushed through the base baseball. I think I finished it in under three minutes. I definitely rushed through the NBA. I, I'm i sorry. <laughs> Football's back. A lot of people are talking about it. Uh, I have confirmed, for those wanting to know about the fantasy football portion, I am going to be doing the three ESPN leagues. I will broadcast them here. Again, I will not be doing any of the NFL.com leagues on here. Due to, I'm sure they'll be publicized elsewhere. So, moving on. As the school year approaches for many schools, my goal is to start recording consistently. As you can see, the walls are still not done. Once the walls are painted, we will probably be moved in. Uh, there's a few other things that need done for those interested in how the house project's going. So, in closing, everyone, please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, I'm sorry this is another really, really, I call them quick episodes, but however, they're so long in some people's eyes. Um, probably... If you're curious why I'm cutting this short, I'm going to be doing some work uh, as my job's getting more and more into the demand. Now that school's starting back up, I'm going to be more and more busy during the day. However, working here at night, get us moved in, get to see more exciting broadcasts, with more content, more energy, and of course, more color once the color's in the uh, once again, I am your host, Michael, or Byro, and for Byro Sports Talk, I hope you have a wonderful day, wonderful weekend, wonderful life, and I will see you next time. You're one of us, you're coming with me.